James Corbett is uh, fascinating for a very similar reason to Dominic Cruz. Uh, in fact, he really does remind me of Dominic Cruz when you see him moving. Corbett was one of the first fighters to really utilise movement to maintain the distance between himself and his opponent and, uh, and fight from a distance where they couldn't hit him and he'd have to leap in to hit them. So what he was very good at was fainting and, and darting in and out. In fact, if we talk a little bit about styles here, what we know about John L. Sullivan is that he loved his overhand, uh, that he could, hit, he could hit with both hands. Uh, later, he wrote a column called Jolts with John L., which was absolutely hilarious. Every uh, anecdote ended with a, so I showed him what for... Uh, and I had the last laugh. Jim Corbett was much more about footwork, um, variously called the, the dancing master and all sorts of things. A lot of people accused him of being a runner later when uh, when he'd beaten Sullivan, uh, because Sullivan was the people's hero, even though he'd been out of the ring for three years. And most, you know, nowadays we would know that that's a sign that a fighter's probably not going to do great when he gets back in. But um, back then, John L was considered unbeatable. A lot of what uh, Corbett did was to maintain the distance and uh, ask the opponent to step onto him. Similar to uh, how Jack Johnson and Joe Chuinsky and, and people like that are shown to use their jab uh, as a, a short intercepting weapon to, to cut and bruise the face as the opponent steps in. Uh, he does a really interesting uh, long left hook to the body, which is throwing palm down so that it's um, it's, it's like a hook to the head. It's, it's not like an elbow closed shovely hook to the body. In fact, if you watch um, George Groves versus Carl Froch, uh, Groves really likes the uh, to, to jab upstairs and then step in with a, a long, almost full left hook to the sternum uh, in a similar sort of fashion. The whole story of uh, Corbett's career is his lead hand. Uh, the jabs, the intercepting jabs, the darting in and out, jabs to the body especially. Um, that's something that's remarked upon in his fight with uh, Sullivan. The jabs to the body, which, you know, even then people were thinking that they weren't a legit punch in, in the same way that an overhand right was or, or something like that um, but he, he was able to win a lot of people with that one. Corbett believed of course in the clinch uh, one of the very first scientific fighters in that sense was happy to tie up if uh, if it suited him you know this was as we moved away from the era of wrestling because uh, we're out of the London prize rules days and into the Marcus of Queensbury rules days which discourage wrestling but uh, he used the clinch very well to, to smother opponents and uh, halt attacks. It's always interesting to hear how fighters of the next generation feel about the ability of a, of a fighter previous to them, because a lot of this stuff is hidden by poor camera uh, quality, film quality, you know, early uh, film technology. Um, but Gene Tunney, who was uh, heavyweight champion of the world after Dempsey, he beat Dempsey through beautiful footwork, circling out constantly, um, very scientific fighter, but he idolised James Corbett. Um, and they became friends later in life, uh, and they'd playfully spar from time to time. And uh, he said that Corbett was obsessed with movement. Um, he even drew out diagrams and, and problems like chess problems of footwork. Uh, so he was huge on sidestepping as people charged him into corners, um, which might seem like a standard thing now, but was uh, very rare for a guy to be able to do that consistently back in the day. Uh, the fight normally just happened wherever you got caught, um, but Corbett could control exactly where the fight happened. Tunney himself is interesting because he believed uh, in punching with just the arm. Uh, he, uh, Jack Dempsey used to talk about mechanical men. Uh, Tunney believed that you should punch just from the arm and leave your, your weight and your feet free to move. He thought that punching piston-like just from the arm straight uh, was enough. Allegedly, in 1925, a guy called Grantland Rice uh, convinced Corbett and Tunney to have a little spa. Uh, three rounds in the gloves. Uh, only two minute rounds, because at the time, Corbett was uh, nearly 60, and uh, apparently he asked for uh, a pair of long gym pants, because if you've ever seen any footage of Jim Corbett, he it's truly bizarre. He has these shorts that show basically his whole ass cheek, or maybe under cheek, like under boob. Um, and it's just so strange that these were the days when like a, a lady's calf was indecent, but James Corbett's dancing around with his ass cheeks hanging out. Um, so he asks for these longer trousers because he's almost 60. And um, they spar three two-minute rounds. And um, Tunney's words afterwards apparently were, I honestly think he's better than Benny Leonard. It was the greatest thing I've ever seen in the ring. I learned plenty. Continuing on the style of James Corbett, there's a fantastic clip of him spar of uh, him 
playfully demonstrating techniques with Tunney himself. Um, and he shows a uh, a technique in the clinch that um, Daniel Cormier atten- attempted to use against John Jones, uh, using the overhook and then passing the other wrist to the overhooking hand and freeing the 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 other one hand to hit the head while the other hand ties up both arms. Um, don't know if he ever pulled it off in a fight, but it was a pretty cool little technique, and it was interesting to see Daniel Cormier attempting it uh, almost again, uh, successfully against John Jones of all people. Now, the big punch of the day was uh, the cross counter. I mean, it's still a very dangerous punch, but uh, coming out of the bare knuckle period, uh, you still have people like Joe Gans scoring all their big knockouts with uh, cross counters. Cross counter is the looping right hand across the top of the uh, opponent's jab. You slip to the inside of the jab and you throw the right hand over the top. Jim Corbett loved a very strange punch, which looks absolutely bizarre if you see it on film. Um, which was to slip inside the jab and throw a long uppercut almost from behind him uh, and and try and catch the opponent up inside their jab. Um, And this is recounted in the Bob Fitzsimmons fight. Uh, The press are are saying that it's a ludicrous uppercut and it's missing by a ridiculous distance, except the one time that he caught uh, Fitzsimmons and split his lips open and, and cut his tongue. Um, and uh, after the fight Bob Fitzsimmons was like I I don't think I was ever in trouble except that one punch that he split my lip open with so he's got this really weird uppercut Um, and it looks a lot like the Dominic Cruz style bump out to very very long rear uppercut Uh, and someone asked me about rear uppercuts on the podcast the other week and I just said don't (laughs) but um, it's a really interesting idea as someone who loves the cross counter I've always wanted to play with it but it's just so dangerous so Corbett um, didn't come out of nowhere. He he went he ran through some of the best fighters of his day. He beat Joe Chuinsky, uh, who we're going to talk to uh, talk about a lot more in um, the Jack Johnson episode we do next. Um, and he, there's a little really interesting little bit of sparring between him and Jim Jeffries that I want to touch on. 